Welcome back to the Herbalist Hour. Today, I'm excited to have on Megan Rhodes. Welcome to the show, Megan. Thank you. Welcome to the Herbalist Hour. This is where community gather, merging the power of people and the flowers, the sweet and the bitter to the salty, the sour. Oh, mommy, it's time for the Herbalist Hour. Well, let's uh, start these shows how we usually do. Let's get to know Megan a little bit better. Megan, how, uh, well, first of all, what were you like, say, as a kiddo, and how did that lead you to your path for studying herbalism? Huh? Um, as a kiddo, <laughs> <laughs> um, I had mandatory outside playtime because I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I lived on a street and it was all boys and they were all doing boy suburban street things uh and i was just i was just not into it i was a proper nerd i want you know <laughs> bookworm i had that sort of beauty and the beast bell kind of i'll i'll sit and read my books and someday i'll go on an adventure kind of <laughs> perspective. <laughs> so my mum used to make me have a uh, mandatory outside playtime which uh i fulfilled to the minimum possible requirement <laughs> fair enough yeah. Um, to you know, to, so now being a herbalist, um, my father, who's passed away now, would say, "Who are you, and what have you done with my daughter?" <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> not in the sense of, you know, I always obviously loved knowledge, loved sure. learning, um, but didn't really have any connection with nature. I mean, I was in classic suburbia. The closest I got was, you know, when my mom and I would go to Home Depot because she loved that she's got a green thumb and we'd go to the garden bit and we'd get the annuals and I'd sit out there as part of my mandatory outside playtime and watch her <laughs> put the pansies in and what have you. Um, but, you know, as you grow up, things change in your life and you've got to start taking responsibility for yourself as an adult. And I had always had gut issues, health issues, that sort of thing, which, you know, a lot of people have. Um, and I just didn't know that it wasn't normal to have a meal and then swig some Pepto-Bismol mm. afterwards. So wow. Pepto-Bismol was like the flavor of my youth, which of course now we know is really not good to have the quantities I had. Wow. <laughs> But, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Sure. Um, and it wasn't until I got to uni and my roommate actually had celiacs. And I had was chatting to her about, oh, yeah, gluten and da, da, da. And she said, well, that's what I've got. And I've got celiacs. And I went, oh. Hmm. So I went down quite this bit of, you know, journey, exploration, got diagnosed with celiacs. Ten years later, got undiagnosed with celiacs, hmm. interestingly. Um, but really just had to pay attention to health, food, and cluing myself up on what was going on and in my body. Um, and my mum had always taken us to the, the health food store, which I always thought was that kind of funny smelling grocery store. I love that smell. I know, I know. I'm like, oh, I love that smell. And I go into the apothecary in my house and it smells like that. And I'm, mm, yeah. yes. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Um, but, uh, you know, my mom gradually learned more and more about natural health remedies. Mm. And so I learned about it from her. And then as I got older and older, you know, she'd say, oh, you know, I've read this article about how, uh, you know, aluminium and how, you know, it's seeping into things. And so get that out of your kitchen. I'm like, okay, great. And I've learned this about that herb. So we were sharing knowledge. Um, and, cool. you know, in bits and pieces. And ultimately, I went on a workshop, a mm. seasonal workshop, didn't actually know what herbalism was called, you know, sort of looking for whole plants, natural <laughs> health. So I can't even remember what I googled, and came to a Four Seasons workshop. And the first day I was there, it was like champagne in my body, everything wow. was like, yes. Um, so that's when I knew, okay, it's time to retrain, change careers, do the whole thing, and just infuse all of this really, really deeply into my life. So um, that's how I went from mandatory outside playtime <laughs> and nose in the books to, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I'm a, a qualified clinical herbalist. Uh, but I primarily teach herbal medicine. 
living on a small holding in rural northern England. So <laughs> very different. <laughs> totally. I guess a few questions. First of all, where are you based? And then um, I I'm curious what the term qualified herbalist is. I've actually never somehow heard that before, but I presume where you're based, that's a, that's a thing. Yeah, so um, I'm in Northern England, uh, in Yorkshire, and I will not attempt the accent because I would not do it justice. Okay. <laughs> but I don't have it. Um, <laughs> so I'm in North Northern England, uh, where it's very cold, uh, which is quite a difference from my native Florida. Mm. Uh, and qualified herbalist, yes, that's, that's the phrase I use because I could say that I'm a medical herbalist or a mm. clinical herbalist because I have done a four-year qualification. I'm a member of you know two professional bodies over here. Um, one of the core Western herbal medicine ones, as well as the one of the core Ayurvedic uh, practitioner mm. ones. Um, but I personally don't really resonate with that phrase because it feels for me and I'm not saying it is necessarily inherently but for me it feels quite white coat mm, yeah. um and I'm very uh I guess to just say what it is I'm quite down with the system so <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> so you. um you know I don't want people to feel that I'm white coat mm. uh when when we're interacting, but at the same time, I want to give them that reassurance that um, I've not just been on a one day workshop and have hung out my shingle, which legally in the UK, because herbal, uh, herbal medicine is not a um, regulated profession, technically somebody can do. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make sure that people had a sense of this is somebody who's had proper training. This is somebody who could, you know, go through various, you know, medical processes if need be. Um, mm -hmm. So that I've got that background with teaching them, but in a much more, I think, practical life focused way rather than clinical perspective. What were you doing before as a career? Um, and are you a full time herbalist now? I am a full-time herbalist now. Nice. Uh, hooray! Yeah, <laughs> um, nicely done. You did thank it. Thank you. I did it. Yes. <laughs> um, previously, I worked in corporate tech for 10 okay. years. Yeah. Is that why your I... website's so beautiful? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> I, did it. I did it myself. So thank yeah, it's you. Lovely. That's lovely. Yeah. A wonderful compliment. Um, mm. I, I spend a lot of little, you know, tweaking time on that because I can't yeah. help it. Um, but yes, I sort of fell backwards into into corporate tech. I actually did my undergraduate in the States in mm. intercultural relations and then did my master's here in the UK in uh, European studies research and was meant to go into a PhD. And halfway through that, I was like, Mm, I, feeling I, it. I can see where I've now taken the same course five times that I will teach for the next 20 years if I keep doing this and it was just I wasn't feeling it so um, I finished the masters and um, got chatting to friends and got introduced to a friend of a friend who who worked in corporate tech in marketing and I had mm. always kind of liked marketing sure ended up there 10 years, <laughs> 10 years cracking on, but very quickly realized this isn't what I want to do with the rest of my life. You know, yeah. it was just selling. Uh, I mean, it was a, you know, a wonderful company, very kind to their employees. So I'm not knocking it. Yeah. Um, but I just felt like I was helping big companies um, convince people that they needed to spend more money to achieve some sort of made up end right and I thought that's not what I want to do with my life um and as soon as I figured out that you could be a herbalist that herbalism was a thing yeah I was like this is what I want to do and as I as I trained and qualified and then started a clinical practice um I realized what really lights me up is teaching other people it's that you know teaching people how to fish yeah peace yeah. because from my perspective like you just switch you light that spark in in each home again that spark that used to be there of this knowledge that people used to have of the plants in their bodies before it got 
systematically squashed out over various historical periods, you light that up again, we are going to be so much more powerful as societies and and so much more resilient and happy and thriving. And I thought, if I can contribute to that, yeah. you know, sign me up. So that's what I'm doing. That's my day job. That's rad. And you get to use your marketing savvy and your IT savvy to market yourself and your services now. So that's that's uh, amazing that you were able to make that transition. Uh, would you care to touch on uh, who some of your herbal mentors have been along mm. the way? Feel free to shout anybody out who's been influential in your work. Sure. So um, that very first workshop I went on, when I signed up for it, I just liked the description. And I went to chat to my husband's cousin, who's incidentally also a herbalist. Oh, wow. And, uh, and she said, oh, who's teaching the course? I said, oh, I don't know. Let me look it up. So I'm you know, scrolling through my confirmation emails. And I said, it says Annie McIntyre. And she said, you realize she's like one of the foremost herbalists there is. And I was like, oh, no, I just thought it sounded like a good course. So I was extremely fortunate to start learning herbalism proper with Annie. Um, so I did a year with her and then I carried on for was it another five years. I sort of lost track wow. um, with her in an apprenticeship of the crossover between Ayurveda and Western herbal medicine with a really tight cohort of um, of other qualified and uh, soon to be qualified herbalists, um, whilst doing my my qualification course, which was with Nikki Darrell, who's based up in Ireland at the Plant Medicine School, um, and they've now got qualification courses all um, in multiple locations in the UK and Ireland, and they're they're brilliant. Nikki is so cool and so you know anti-establishment and just <laughs> she just you know a true herbalist oh yeah like when, you know you just yeah it's it, i could go on but she they're they're both absolutely brilliant and incredibly skilled and talented in their own ways and i'm extremely grateful to have have studied directly with them both for for many years so you actually traveled to ireland to study with the plant medicine school Yes, yeah, I used to go back and forth to Ireland. Nice. Uh, being in Northern England, it was closer than some of the courses in the south of the UK. Yeah. <laughs> so I went over there, yeah. Just a quick break from the show to thank our presenting sponsor, Oshala Farm. Oshala Farm is a beautiful and vibrant certified organic herb farm based in Southern Oregon, where they grow and sell over 80 different plant species. The founders, Elise and Jeff Higley, have been longtime friends, so I highly trust their growing methods and ethics. You'll love the potency and vibrancy of all the herbs they have to offer. To learn more and purchase their herbs and other organic goods, head to oshalafarm.com. So thanks once again to Oshala Farm for sponsoring the Herbalist Hour. Now back to the show. Enjoy. Well, I'm a like 22% Irish and I've always wanted to go visit. So it'd be fun to visit some plant people while I'm there. So maybe I'll have to hit up the plant medicine school if they're still around. Oh, definitely. Yeah. If you if you ever plan that trip, send me a message because they are so cool and so grassroots and they would love to have you. Yeah, I'm sure. Awesome. Well, uh, I know one of your specialties is talking about flavors. Uh, mm -hmm. And I saw on your website, you, uh, you, you talk about seven flavors. I feel like who was, I was just interviewing David Winston. He's got a 10 flavor system. Of course, is the five flavor system. What's going on with these uh, seven flavors and what are they? <laughs> so I've sort of, um, I've taken inspiration from my training, which is really, really, um, Western herbal medicine and Ayurveda. And for me, they're, they're so enmeshed that, mm -hmm. um, they're, they're just, Okay, you can't separate them. I love that. So, yeah. Um, it, it's a really well-rounded perspective, I think, because it makes sure you've got the energetics, but it gives you access to um, not just the Ayurveda curves, which are brilliant, but that concept of working with and understanding herbs, but in a local context with your local herbs as well. Mm. So I sort of combine the, the classic tastes of the two, to get to seven. So for me, my seven tastes, my flavor menu <laughs> <laughs> um, is bitter, of course, uh, astringent, salty, aromatic, pungent, which I smoosh together and sort of I view that as a, a spectrum. 
Uh, so aromatic as in like rosemary, but also chili peppers. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, exactly. Um, mucilaginous, which, you know, isn't so much a specific taste as a mouth feel. Yeah. Um, but it, astringent is, is similar to that, but because it's so distinct in the mouth yeah. um, and it does distinct things in the body. And then sour and sweet. So those are my my seven that I uh, I use to to formulate with and that I subject my students to. <laughs> gotcha. I know part of your uh, health journey has to do with, say, gut health. Has a bitter has the bitter flavor been pivotal in your healing journey, or um, what else helped you along heal your gut? Uh, I mean, the bitter taste is is usually really helpful yeah. with you know gut uh gut imbalances um astringent is also quite helpful mm. um i worked quite a bit with calendula which has all sorts of you know tones to it um but as a i guess a a, a non-taste but a side point that i think is worth mentioning for anybody listening who's going oh yeah gut stuff me <laughs> uh, my one of my favorite herbs don't tell the other herbs is actually bone broth. Mm, I, right. sw I swear by bone broth. Absolutely swear by bone broth. Um, so that was a really big part of of my gut healing journey as well, which has its. I mean, you know, that's like a whole. I've I've got the bone broth bible that you know the nourishing traditions. Oh yeah, just, Sally Fallon. <laughs> oh yeah, the whole thing, and that that is one of my my go tos. So yeah, the, the bone broth is a whole other world, but definitely beneficial for the gut and healing. Good tip. Yeah, we make bone broth at least once a week here. And uh, we also find excuses uh, to throw herbs in there as well, such as mm -hmm. astragalus. I've even been known to sneak in a little reishi mushroom slices in there, hopefully nice. not altering the flavor too much. Um, do you have any particular herbs that you like to throw into bone broth? I do because I used to do, um, growing up in the States, you know, you kind of, you get the standard chicken noodle soup. Um, when you've got a cold, which has got bone broth in it. Um, but I absolutely love something I, I encountered living in London is pho, which I know I'm not pronouncing correctly. I think we say pho. I yeah. think it's supposed to be pho, but yeah. I'm sure, you know, it's with the, you know, with my, my own accent. I do my For best. For sure. <laughs> Respect. Um, but oh, I just love it. I love it. And for me... So. The herbs and spices that you infuse in the bone broth with that, it just makes it next level because you get, it's really that aromatic pungent range. So I put in um, clove, coriander, mm. cinnamon, star anise, ginger, cardamom. I think that's it. Oh, and, and garlic and some garlic. Um, which is what I put in. And then every once in a while, if I want a bit of extra oomph, I'll like grab a bay leaf from my back door and chuck it in. <laughs> um, oh, I love bay. Yeah, but all of those together, they're so aromatic. And you've got some of the more, you know, towards the more pungent end of the spectrum. And all of those aromatic pungent herbs are so antimicrobial and they're warming up the gut, they're getting the digestive fire going, and it tastes nice. So for me, I rarely make bone broth without those. I just sort of make my pho broth, pho pho <laughs> pho broth. <laughs> you say pho, I say pho, or yeah, reverse, we whatever. <laughs> we have it every week, and when it gets out of the rotation, I know, because someone gets sick. You know, it's just like, it just keeps that immune system going, gets any of those microbes, you know, scooted on their way and uh, is great for the digestion. So that's my, my favorite blend. I'm not sure how old your kid is, but does your kid appreciate pho at this point? She does. She's three. Okay. And she is a, a proper herbalist child. <laughs> she will happily subject herself to anything and everything. She's been having um <clears throat> she's been having tincture blends since she was six months uh ish. Um she's been having tea through, you know, when I was feeding her from the beginning. She I mean, she takes stuff straight out of the pipette <laughs> <laughs> and one time i gave um gave my husband a taste of it because he was like i just want to get a taste of what you're giving her and he was like 
whoa, that yeah. is intense. And she's like, can I have a bonus bit, please? Can I have <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you've had enough. Seriously, that, that's enough for today. And make sure you follow it with water. Um, but no, she's used to all of it, all of it. So she's really happy to try anything with herbs and spices. And that's, you know, I know not everybody, um, not everybody's kids start out that early. Right. But one of my tips, you know, people say, how do you get kids to take herbs? Start them as young as you can. Yeah. She, like, the only sweet stuff she's ever had is fruit. She's not even had honey because I'm I'm quite strict about it. I'm, I'm delaying that range of the sweet taste. Uh, she's had marshmallow root, mm -hmm. but that's right. it. So um, getting her really used to those herbal tastes and developing that palate so that she's quite happy to to have them. Um, I was chatting with my cousin yesterday, who I mentioned who's a herbalist, and uh, her daughter's got a cold at the moment. So she made this mix that was like, oh, um, I think it had, uh, what did it, it had white whorehound, mm. and uh, like all the, I mean, all of the really, really bitter stuff in it, <laughs> the bitter chesty stuff. And she did make it into a syrup. And so she she sent me a video. She tasted it and she was like, it's all right. And I was yeah. like, I messaged her back. I was like, I'm not, I don't think you're convinced. She gives it to her husband to taste and he gives the perfect herbalist spouse response, which is he tastes it, his face processes it and he goes, I've had worse. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and then she gives it to her daughter who's it's for and she just knocks it back and doesn't even chase it with water. And her mom's like, okay, so, and she's like, I mean, nah. whatever. <laughs> so, that, that. yeah, I mean, that's brilliant because then the herbs get in you in those acute situations when you need them more intensely, but you can also weave the taste of your stuff in to your daily life, to your cooking, to your morning tea, to your bath. I mean, obviously you're not Hopefully you're not drinking your bath water, but you know, Ew. <laughs> don't sit in the bath and then scoop up a mug, have Gross. pour a mug first and then pour the rest of the bath. Um, but you know, you get used to those tastes and your palate is really, really acclimated to it. That is a, a great point. And I, yeah, I do want to say children of herbalists have some of the most accepting palates. I've also got my daughter eating disgusting quote unquote things since mm -hmm. an early age. Yeah. Now she's got a very adventurous palette. Um, I've also noticed you kind of start to appreciate the different nuances and flavors and undertones of bitter flavors. For example, mm -hmm. you know how, when people are building their tolerance for spicy food, you could get to the point where you taste the habanero and you taste this like underlying, like delicious fruitiness. Whereas if you're just starting out, you wouldn't actually get that nuance um, but you start to actually really appreciate the flavor of those spicy peppers. Same with bitter. Mm. I've noticed that uh, um, I actually have developed a love for the flavor of gentian root, whereas a lot mm. of people would be find it extremely, extremely bitter. But uh, just like those spicy peppers, you could start to kind of notice the underlying flavor behind what's actually happening in the, the bitterness. Mm -hmm. And with um, the, there are so many different tones to the bitter flavor it's actually quite a broad category of of taste um and when i teach workshops uh i often take people by uh, a big wormwood plant mm. and i say okay only you only need a little bit just <laughs> try a little bit you know and everybody goes what and anybody who's been on previous seasons is like oh no i'm good i've done this one already. Right? <laughs> and they just kind of watch everybody else um i remember my my first um uh, foray into herbal bitters was fresh burdock leaf. Mm. Um, and so you see people taste wormwood and they go, whoa. And then I explain to them, yes, it's bitter, but it's a really specific type of bitter taste. And I think wormwood really um, exemplifies it really well, that thujone quality in there. Mm. And then I explain wormwood, worm, parasites so that really particular bitter note is very anti-parasitic mm. so if you taste something like that 
and somebody's got parasites, then go for that taste, go for that herb, which of course then sparks the conversation of, oh, so if my dog has worms, or what? Right. <laughs> and then I have to give this sort of, um, uh, the, the, the responsible answer in the UK context of practicing, which is legally I'm not allowed to say anything about animals and herbs because they have different anatomy and physiology to us, but you can draw your own conclusions because I can't tell you what to do or not to do in your own garden, but legally I can't say anything about that. <laughs> and that's kind right, of... Right, right. <laughs> um, but uh, I did make quite a big batch of wormwood infusion when our chickens got bugs once. And oh wow! And that went in can you legally say if that was effective? Uh, some of it went in their water, and <laughs> that's all I can say about there that. You go. That's what we did on our home thing. That is yeah. not advice. That's an anecdote. <laughs> For sure. Well, you know, not necessarily switching gears. I have a question I'm in my head. I'm going to see if I could formulate it. But I saw mm -hmm. on your uh, Instagram account. I want to say you you said the golden rule of formulation is keeping it simple. Mm. And um, I'm thinking of Shisandra Berry, which I also heard you briefly touch on on that um, plant cutting podcast. Mm. Um, first of all, it almost seems as, as if Shisandra Berry itself is almost like a formula in itself because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to like formulate a question here around flavors. It's got five flavors. It's known as the yeah. five flavor fruit. Um, what's your take on Shisandra? Can due to the fact that it all has five flavors already. Um, and how do you, um, do you use Shisandra? What is your just take on, on Shisandra as a five, five flavor fruit kind of compared to what we're talking about right now? Yeah. So I love Shisandra. It's delicious. It um, is. I would love Shisandra because I'm very high pitta mm. and it's, <laughs> it's exactly that type of taste that pitta is like and it's antiviral and it gives you oomph. So a pitta person is like, yes, I can go for days on this. <laughs> okay. um, so I try to uh, temper myself with it personally <laughs> so I don't overdo it. Absolutely. Um, when I teach formulation, you say keep it simple. So it's really, really tempting. And I did the same when I first started learning. You learn, you wanna learn all the herbs all the herbs and then something happens and you want to put all the herbs in your formula. And I did that once when I was just starting to learn and it was very difficult to determine which of the herbs or multiple which of the herbs uh, was having the laxative effect for the person I <laughs> gave it to. She didn't thank me, but she was a friend, it was fine. <laughs> She was all right. She just had a good clear out. Um, but she didn't want to take it again, obviously. And frankly, usually people need a good clear out anyway. Um, but there are gentle ways to do that that won't upset people. Um, so when you throw everything into a formula, mm -hmm. you've got, so, first of all, so many tastes. But you've also got so many herbs that each do so many things. So it's like, um, you know, you've got a friend who needs help and with, with a life thing, for example, they're going through something. How are they going to feel if you put them in a room with 15 really well-intentioned people <laughs> who have all got all of their life experience to contribute? They're going to be totally overwhelmed <laughs> and it's not going to be help. It's, it's too much. Mm. And it's really hard to understand then who's going to be the most supportive. However, if you've got somebody who needs help with something in their life and you really take the time to listen to where are they at, what's going on for them, and you know, you know them, you know their personality and how they work. You could then pick maybe three really good people to support them, and then they've got a nice support net. Um, and then if they're not gelling with somebody, it's really obvious who they're not gelling with, and then you swap them out. So when I teach my intensive course, the first year we only do three herb formulations, mm. which to me 10 years ago... <laughs> would be like, oh, how could you restrict me to that? I would have put everything in and I know all these plants now. 
But um, with time comes wisdom and experience. um, And it helps you really focus. It makes sure that you you build that deep relationship with each of the individual plants so that you know everything they can bring to the table. They're not just there because they, you know, you don't just chuck St. John's wort in because it's supportive for nerve pain and then ignore all the other aspects of St. John's wort because it's still going to be doing those things. Um, So we start with three herbs and that forms the core. In year two, we then go up to five herbs. So we've got that core and then we're adding in our, you know, that's your main cast and then you're adding in your supporting characters. Um, And they're probably slightly less than the other ones. So we're starting to get a sense of how to build that picture of not just which herbs and how many herbs, but the proportions amongst them. Mm. Then in year three, we do seven herbs. And that's where, you know, the other two are adding in. That's when somebody goes, oh, I'm just going to put that little, little splash of rose in for the energetic support, Mm. for example. Um, And then what comes after that, in my opinion, is the most difficult, the one that takes the most skill and experience, which is simples. Mm. Because you've really got to know, I mean, you've got to know that herb like you know yourself every uh, probably better because you know there was there was those bits that we want to ignore of ourselves um oh yeah but you've got to know it really really well and you've got to know that the person you're matching that one herb with that that whole situation is a really really good match um so I know some people love working with simples and they go straight for simples and they've got a lot of experience with that. And obviously that is, I mean, amazing. But I think for people when they're they're first starting out to to them be tempted, you know, the, the opposite extreme of chuck everything in is, oh, I'll just do a simple, I'll just do one. And then they're like, eh. They don't really see the, um, to use a, a, a not very nuanced phrase, they don't see the results, quote unquote, they're looking for. They're trying to to bring to effect because there's there's a bit more to that picture they need to work with. There's more knowledge and experience that needs to develop. So Shazandra, I think, is a brilliant, because it's got those five tastes, because it's so complex, is a really brilliant candidate for either a simple when you're at that quite advanced stage or um for something to add in as maybe um maybe a secondary herb because it's it's so complex unless you had it as sort of the shining element Mm. and then maybe two little supporting things are always you know you can always play with the ratios but I think it's important to keep in mind how complex Shizandra is with all this taste and take that into account when you're formulating. Gotcha. Uh, we, we were bringing up palettes earlier, children's palettes, and I'm just kind of mm. curious, um, how does one, if someone has a not very accepting palette, if you will, how does one <laughs> recalibrate their palette to detect the seven flavors? Yes, yeah, children of all ages. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Because you you get grown adults who are like, I cannot, I don't want anything unless it's coming in a, you know, sicky, sweet, sugar syrup type thing. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of glycerites. Mm. Um, I know that, you know, some people make them with uh, some alcohol blended with the glycerin. Some people make them with just the glycerin. Um, I do teach them, but they're not my favorite because of sort of, you know, the glycerin is quite processed and for a whole host of reasons. Um, but also because it's got that really sicky sweet taste. Yeah. And I think um, because of that, if you've got somebody who's really used to that kind of taste, who's really used to artificially sweet taste, you know, all those artificial like lab made hyped up taste i think um actually working with herbal uh glycerides is a good place to start because 
it gets that sweetness in that they're used to, so it gets it down the hatch to begin with, right. <laughs> which is a starting point that's important. Um, and then as they taste different ones, they can start to differentiate between, okay, this is the sweetness of the glycerin, and this is the plant. Because rosemary glycerite will taste different to... Uh, marshmallow root glycerite, right, which is nearly impossible to get out of the bottle, um, right. or, <laughs> or licorice glycerite, right, or oregano glycerite, right, or lavender, or chamomile, or lemon balm. So you'll still get the difference of the taste. Um, although if you don't absolutely need that, I wouldn't, you know, say that's definitely your starting point. I'd say if, if you've got somebody who's a, a child of any age who really refuses anything other than, then you can start there. Um, but when you want to specifically get to know the taste of herbs, again, I always say keep it simple. Either mm. pick one taste or one herb, because one herb will have multiple tastes. So you may, for example, say, I mean, if you're you're going for it, you can start with the bitter taste. Um, or you might want to start with aromatic pungent because everybody's got that in their their kitchens, you know, right. start maybe with aromatic pungent and have just one herb that you know is aromatic pungent. You can use a reference book, you make a list of, you know, five, 10, whatever. Don't go, don't do too many um, herbs that you know are aromatic pungent. Make the tea of just one herb at a time and drink it and do that for a week. Some people would say, oh, a week's not very long. Other people would say, oh my God, a week? I've got to drink the same thing for a week. You don't have to drink it nonstop. Right, right. <laughs> but, you know, have yeah. a mug a day sure. for a week. Really get used to that taste in the mouth and start just making notes. Don't look at the reference books of what it does, but start making notes. Where do I feel this going in my body? What is, what's happening in my mouth? Is it drying? Is it moistening? Am I starting to feel warmer or cooler? Um, is it making me feel huh, really relaxed and like things are loosening up? Or is it making me feel, you know, tighter and like I've got more structure? Make notes. Do a different aromatic or pungent herb. You'll start to, like we said with bitter ones, you'll start to taste the nuances within it. And you'll start to get a really nice picture building up on your palate of where that taste goes in the mouth, what the affinities are, how it's moving through the body, the energetics of it. So that when you then go to look up what the herb quote unquote does, mm. you already know. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I knew that. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh yeah, I didn't think of that one, but actually I can see how that works. And then you, it's stuck in your body. Because you've so good. been working with it in your body. I mean, I did the whole, like, I mean, you can see all the books behind me. I'm a total bookworm. I always really, <laughs> I love it. Yay, books. Um, <laughs> but you can, you can write all the monographs you want. And I have done this. You get the pile of the 15 books that are your core 15. And then you go to the monograph of each of those. And then you copy down everything. <laughs> and by the time you've done it, A, you've got no idea what you've written. B, you've probably got, you know, the same couple of actions and, and symptoms and whatever 10 times over and you haven't realized. And you've not absorbed it. But when you know the taste of something in your mouth, you know, the senses are so tightly connected to memory. You know, like with smell, you smell a certain thing and you go, oh, gosh, my grandma, you know, uh, or oh, that really lovely family holiday or oh, that, you know, creepy bloke or what I <laughs> <laughs> so you it's it really connects us so creepy when bloke. you've got <laughs> I don't know that was good when, I mean I, I don't know if anyway um, mm. <laughs> but it gets so so baked into you and the sort of um not cosmic joke or catch 22, but the sort of the, the funny loop in there is we think that by doing that exercise, we're baking that into our bodies. But actually what we're doing is waking up something that's already baked in there. Mm. Because those tastes 
and what when the body gets those tastes what it then does how it responds that's something that's been passed down in human dna since you know the dawn of time when the first cave person said to the other cave person you eat it no you eat it and we'll see <laughs> what happens um, i've been watching that you know i'm, I'm gonna say something really silly now for the sake Let's of i've been watching that saber-toothed tiger munch on that herb and it's not died so i think it's okay <laughs> right right <laughs> i'm i'm sure i'm i'm not a paleon <laughs> yeah that's not my era <laughs> sure um but that information has been passed down because it's survival information. It's the same information as when, um, you know, when you've got a newborn baby and if you just lay them on you, they crawl to get to their first feed. Yeah. They, they don't even, re they just do it. Yeah. it. Or like, a, you know, if you look at, you know, other, other creatures in nature, you know, how many animals are born and then they just stand up and start feeding. They just know what to do. Nobody tells them. They don't have. To. It's it's the same with us. So I love that when you eat something that has a you know that has the bitter taste, you don't have to know or teach your body what to do. You taste the bitter taste, and your body goes. Right, bile is going to start flowing in the liver because I know that food and nutrients are coming up. I've got things to digest. We're waking up the system and then we're going to make sure it passes all the way through and gets out, you know, any waste products get out the other end. Everything's going to be, you know, that just happens. So when somebody, I am... Um, I had a conversation with somebody once who said, you know, oh, well, do you have to believe in herbalism hmm. for it to work? And I'm like, okay, it's not a belief system. It's just it's, like a placebo it's a, or something. Yeah, it's a medical yeah. system. But, right. um, and I said, look, if you take a laxative herb, it doesn't matter what you think about that <laughs> plant is going to have that effect on you. <laughs> Your body knows what to do. Your body has received the message that you're taking something in, whether intentionally, <laughs> unintentionally, known to you or not, that it is time to empty the system. So it will. And there's the, like, you can't, you can't stop it. Thank goodness that the rest of nature is smarter than us with our little brains thinking that we know, <laughs> we know better or we can game the system or opt out, you know? Yeah. We're the only... We're the only characters in this, you know, all the world's all the world's a stage, right? We're the only characters in the stage of nature who have stopped actively listening to that conversation. But your body hasn't. So your body will still do it. Thank goodness. Oh my gosh, you dropped so much knowledge there. There's so many different <laughs> Ways we could go with that. I want to say on your Instagram page, I also saw you talk about how animals just instinctively use herbal medicine. Do you yeah. have any examples of that? Or do you want to go into that a little bit? Yeah. So um, I'm not I'm not a massive livestock expert. And I would sure. defer to the details on my husband because he's completely uh, obsessed with our chickens, which is okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and very helpful. Um, but, you know, when you... To the untrained eye, if you look at a cow grazing, yeah. the untrained eye sees that and goes, the cow is eating grass. Just like to the untrained eye, you go for a walk, um, you know, down a, a lane or whatever, um, you know, somewhere where there's, there's lots of nature around, where it's not pavement or whatever. Um, you go for a walk and to the untrained eye, it's, it's green, right? You've kind of got trees, grass, and other things in various shades of green and that's all you see but the cow is not eating grass the sheep mm. is not eating grass what they see are very specific individual plants mm. and in a really well tended well nurtured meadow there are loads of herbs in there and they are, you know, it looks like, oh, it's just a massive tongue scooping it all up. No, no, no. <laughs> they are like, they are picking very specific things yeah. for what they need. Just like once you start learning to identify plants, 
you go for a while. I'll never forget it when when I did my first workshop and we were taken on a, a herb walk and we started the walk on this farm and it was just a sea of green. Oh, and yeah. as we got put and then by the end of the walk, it's just like you've got this this everything is like electric. <gasps> there's this and there's that and there's this and this that. and and you can't you can't unsee it so now i'm that annoying person who oh yeah we'll just go for a walk and i'm like oh look there's free medicine there there's free medicine <laughs> there this is for this so the the animals know this they've always done this they still do this and way back in you know at the dawn of human history when there weren't distracting things to look at because right. a if you got distracted then something ate you <laughs> or, <laughs> um and B, I mean, they just didn't, it was very much about survival. So their observation skills were essential and central yeah. and fundamental to daily life. So they had the opportunity and the need and the impetus to watch what the animals were eating. Mm. And that is that dawn of, hmm, well, I'm used to watching this particular animal and I could see by their behavior that they were feeling this way or that way or they were about to, um, you know, childbirth was beginning or something like that. And then I noticed that they ate that. Hmm. What happens if I eat that? <laughs> Ooh. And then, you know, as time goes on, okay, I know what happens if I eat that. Now, I don't have it all year round. How can I have it so I can extend my access to it? And then you start looking at, you know, preparation methods, right? Um, although, I, you know, I very much emphasize seasonal mm. uh, herbalism, but there are, you know, especially if, you, if you, somebody's working with a prescription on something very specific, you want to be able to have access to that set of herbs as you go. Um, and you know, we, as humans, we preserve our food. I mean, right. we, we grow loads of tomatoes here and you better believe that we preserve them to have them the whole rest of the year. Right. You know, it's not, oh, you're not allowed to eat tomatoes except out of summer. So, <laughs> you know, these are skills we've had to develop as small holders. Those are skills that, um, you know, humans in past generations developed and skills that humans of our generation are, bringing back into their consciousness, bringing back into their hands, into their homes, into their daily lives, because it gives us that ability to survive, I would say survive quite a challenging current world context um, in many facets, but also then to have resilience. You know, you, um, if you grow your own herbs or you, you know, responsibly forage herbs and you know how to make medicine out of them, you didn't have to worry about, so this is a whole other tangent, you don't have to worry <laughs> about supply chains or whatever. If your family gets sick, whether it's in times of global uh, non-crisis or crisis, shall we say, somebody gets sick. You've got something in your cupboard for that, yeah. you know. If there's a, if there's a true emergency, obviously seek emergency services. That is what they're there for. Um, but man, I mean, to have that resilience and autonomy, it's just it's next level. It's uh, that I mean that kind of stuff just like lights me up. And then I'm I like, can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Herbal, you know, have an apothecary in every home. Amen. Megan, I'm, I'm really glad that you quit your IT and marketing jobs So because it sounds like you found your path and you're so yeah. passionate about it. So cool. I do want to say a huge shout out and thanks to Laco and Diana for joining us live. They're Herb Rally Schoolhouse members. Uh, Diana actually has a question for yeah. Megan. And Diana says, hi, Mason and Megan. Loving this interview. Thank you, Diana. Uh, Thank you. Question. What would be one of your bitter formula recipes for children? I'm trying not to use alcohol with my grandchildren. Depends what you want to do. <laughs> my students know my answer to most questions is it depends. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Classic so, teacher response. Yeah. Um, in terms of the specific herbs to go in or the type of preparation. Okay. Um, if Diana's around right now, 
we maybe we get more specifics on that. Well, I could say in the meantime is yeah. um, you can always add in, um, you know, bitter herbs are really pokey. You don't, I mean, obviously there's a spectrum, but they're pokey and you, you, with herbal medicine, we don't have to think that more is more. Think more enough is enough. So if you want to get bitters into somebody for support for whatever reason, don't think that you've got to like completely pummel them with bitters because A, they'll never take it again. Um, and B, that is a lot for the body to handle. So think about enough is enough, and then how can I balance that with um, with the rest of the formula and think about taste and making it palatable. So you can always, um, you know, depending on age um, and, you know, any allergies or whatever, you can always add in a bit of peppermint. Peppermint is a fairly, you know, flavor that people are fairly familiar with, not really offended by, generally, can you imagine? Peppermint, you're very offensive. Right, um, right. And you don't need a lot to really bring through quite a strong peppermint taste. So you can add in something like a pinch of that to help kind of temper that intense bitterness so that it doesn't taste as intense. Yeah, so Diana says specific herbs to go in and the preparation for them to have a little bit before a meal. And then uh, she responded even more. Uh, she was thinking peppermint, orange peel, and potentially yeah. something else. Yeah, exactly. Or you could um, uh, you could counter with a little bit of the a little bit of sour as well. So maybe some rose hip, mm. um, something like that. And if you're thinking about bitters pre meal, those are really nice uh, to infuse in apple cider vinegar because you get the extra digested totally. benefits of the, the vinegar as well. And you can make it a sort of rhythm where cool. my grandfather, way who knew nothing about herbs, way back when, before apple cider vinegar was cool, right. used to have a tablespoonful of apple, apple cider vinegar before dinner every night. He mm. just did that. So if you infuse it with some herbs, um, and you don't have to go for the the crazy intense ones. I used to do a, for a patient, I used to do a vinegar infusion with uh, bitter herbs to support the liver. And it was wood betony, Cystacus botanica, uh, vervain, so verbena officinalis, and I want to say skullcap, mm. uh, scoot, uh, scoot lat, not, um, not scoot bical. Um, and that was fairly pretty okay. So earlier in the discussion, you were kind of alluding to the way you're teaching your students. Um, and it compelled me to ask, you, you have some sort of intensive coming up or do you, um, is this like open year round? Or can you tell us about some of your educational offerings, your intensive and so on? Yeah, sure. So I teach um, workshops across the season in Yorkshire, so in the Northern UK. Um, and it's primarily focused on on in-person teaching okay. nice. because there are so many brilliant online things. And I know it's like, it just really depends where you are. You've either got nothing near you <laughs> or you've got everything near you. Um, and, you know, the UK is about the same size as the state I'm from. So it's it's a, a bit easier to, to get to different bits. Um, sure. So I teach uh, <clears throat> seasonal workshops. Uh, as well as my intensive course. And I do those at my beautiful yurt on our land, awesome. um, which is, yeah, it's epic. I mean, you know, talk about living the wise woman in the hut dream. <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's rad. Um, so the, the, um, all of the courses I teach have that component of taste in them. Uh, but the intensive course is one that lasts from spring through winter. So it's usually kind of about nine months where we're doing work, um, combination of in-person gatherings and then live Zoom sessions online. And everything is done through 
the senses. So it's all like visceral, tangible, embodied. Um, <laughs> it's it's very much that way of learning. I've I've done too many degrees in my life. <laughs> I've seen too many PowerPoints. I'm just not having it anymore. And I I feel that. Um, you know, herbal medicine is such a thing to be lived that to get it off the page and off of that, you know, aspiration board and into your life, it makes all the difference if you've got access to somebody who you can just go learn in person and meet up with other people who are interested, you know, build that community, build that, that mini village. Um, so that course is for anybody who really wants to get herbalism into their bones and feel confident working with it in their daily lives. So I've got students who are totally new to herbalism, but very keen, you know, they go, oh, I saw your course and I just, I, I was compelled and I go, brilliant, you are my people, come. <laughs> um, you know, and I've got other students who are doing clinical practitioner training and they want more of that hands-on, you know, that visceral bit aside from the academics um, and everything in between. So enrollment for that usually opens in September to the waiting list first um and then um runs for a couple months so uh, i'm not sure when we're gonna air but i've currently got uh enrollment running now for oh. uh for a bonus cohort <laughs> that okay. I, I managed to have time for i was like yes we can teach more people um so if you obviously i'll share the links yeah um people can pop to the website if they happen to be in the uk um and either get on the waiting list or or join the course um, whenever it's open. But enrollment runs annually for that. Um, yes. But obviously not everybody is in Yorkshire. Right. Um, so for anybody who's been listening and quite likes this idea of, of getting the tastes, really getting into that, um, I have uh, actually access that I can share yeah. for the recording of the live session of my intensive course going through the first taste. Wow. So you can go through it with us for free and the worksheet to, to fill out that goes along with it. And then you can use that blank worksheet for other tastes, you know, for your own study to start working through those. But you can do the first one with us. Awesome. So you really get a sense of, okay, what am I doing? looking for what am i feeling for what am i tasting for so you've got that that starting point of guidance and i think it's a really nice um uh aspect to explore if you've not looked at it specifically but maybe you've been studying herbalism for a while um and if you're new to it i think it's a great way to start because it's just so tangible um i think it's one of those keys to unlocking herbalism that really gets you to that aha space yeah. where you can then start using it in in your life so that's um i'm happy to to share access to that as well that's amazing so you'll just give us a link and we can leave it in the podcast yeah. show notes awesome mm -hmm. uh and just for the listener it's roads roots and remedies.co.uk and that's roads r-h-o-d-e-s uh roads roots and Re roads roots and remedies.com yes okay yeah co.uk um also before the show started i actually looked up some stats for our podcast i was curious what percentage of the audience came from the uk it looks like it's our third largest country uh at about five percent of our listeners actually do live in the uk so that's a brill. pretty pretty rad uh shout out to all the uk listeners out there yes. um sweet well we're definitely gonna have to do a round two sometime because there was a lot of other points i wanted to go over oh, so yeah if it, you'd be willing to come back on the show at some point that'd be amazing definitely um, sweet well um oh the other thing i wanted to mention megan i don't know if you know this but herb rally started as an event listing platform and we still do list events uh mostly in the united states but i do we do list events um throughout the world as well so i i did sign up for your newsletter so dear listener definitely sign up for megan's newsletter as well and i'm hoping uh on that newsletter you'll tell us about some events that's coming up for you 
Yes, yeah. Okay. So you'll get the newsletter is um, monthly update, a monthly roundup of events, courses, workshops coming up. Awesome. Um, new articles, uh, new interviews, what we're doing in the year and various things. Um, and then I often send out other bits and pieces in between, depending on, you know, if you're interested in the intensive course, but it's not open for enrollment. Um, if you take the box to say you're interested in the intensive course, then you'll get little updates, little little peeks into um, what the current cohorts are doing. So you can uh, sort of live vicariously through that. <laughs> awesome. Well, and just for the listener, we list events, uh, like I said, internationally, it's herbrally.com slash events slash international. I'll be paying attention to, to Megan's newsletter so I can start listing more of her events that are going on. But well, this has been a lot of fun, Megan. Do you got any like closing thoughts or inspiration you want to impart on the audience before we get out of here? Uh, I mean, it's been absolutely fab to chat with you. I really, really enjoyed it. And I would just say to anybody listening, you know, the um, herbal medicine is so ancient and there's so much knowledge and it runs through every culture and location on the planet. Um, and as much as we want to think we, we can learn it all, you're never going to learn it all, so don't worry about learning it all. Just pick one little pinpoint and don't worry about if it's, oh, should I do lavender or chamomile? Just pick one. <laughs> First herb that pops into your head and just start there. Get to know it like a really, really good friend. And then you'll have these friends for life. They'll never leave you. You'll always know you know, I'm going to call on lavender when this is going on in my life. I'm going to call on chamomile when this, this is going on in my life. Um, and if you you engage with the herbs with that way, you you first of all you get to live herbalism, and second of all you move past thinking about I use this herb for that herb or being reliant on somebody else's you know recipe, cold recipe or cough recipe or whatever, because you then go into your apothecary in your house, whether it's a kitchen cabinet or a full-fledged apothecary, or your own herb garden, or your local herb shop, whatever, um, you go in there, and you've got, you're in that moment, and you just taste it, and you go, okay, mm I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and you can put anything together for anything. It is, it is so freaking empowering <laughs> that, um, yeah, go for it, and enjoy it. That's a great way to wrap up. I love your teaching style, Megan. This has been a lot of fun and Thank excited you. to delve more into your work. So one more time for the listener, that's roadsrootsandremedies.co.uk. Definitely check out the free offering, which was incredibly generous of Megan. Uh, thanks, dear listener, for tuning in. And thanks, a special thanks to the Schoolhouse members for joining us, uh, Laco and Diana. So that's going to do it for this episode of the Herbalist Hour. We'll see you all next time. Take care. Thanks so much for watching today's episode of the Herbalist Hour. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want more great herbal content, be sure to subscribe to our Herb Rally YouTube channel. Uh, if you enjoy these Herbalist Hour episodes and you'd like to join us live, uh, you can do so by becoming an Herb Rally Schoolhouse member. Uh, learn more at herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. And if you want to get your first 30 days for free, use coupon code YouTube30 at checkout. So our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members get access to exclusive video classes, monographs, and a lot more more herbal community discounts um, along with joining these live herbalist hour interviews. So one more time, herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. Enter coupon code YouTube30 at checkout to get your first 30 days for free. All right, we'll see you in the next episode and take care.